Welcome back to another episode of Mercury Playground. Today, I'm going to be making diisopropyl ether. Big word, I know. But all that means is that this has two isopropyl groups. This is different from your regular diethyl ether because of the extra methyl groups. This makes it more nonpolar and less volatile, which allows it to dissolve a larger range of nonpolar substances, and it can even crystallize them. However, these extra methyl groups also make it more prone to peroxidations, which can be explosive. Luckily, I have a trick to prevent that. Watch till the end to find out. The materials need are isopropyl alcohol, sulfuric acid, sodium carbonate, anhydrous magnesium sulfate, and sodium metabisulfite. The first thing I'm gonna do is add 200 milliliters of sulfuric acid. The next thing I'm gonna do is put in 250 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol. This is just to start off the reaction. I'm gonna add more as the reaction progresses. With our distillation system set up, the only thing I need to do now is wait for ether to be produced. I have it set on 160C, and hopefully ether will come through soon. In our reaction flask, you can clearly see that our reaction is starting to happen with the golden amber color our solution has taken on. Two hours later, let's see how our reaction flask looks. In our reaction flask, you can clearly see that it has become black, and that's because some of our alcohol has been oxidized. However, we're still getting a good deal of ether being produced. You can also see some oily puddles, and that's our ether sitting on top of it. It's going to eventually boil off though, because our reaction flask is set at 170 degrees. Turning a whole bottle of isopropyl alcohol into ether will take a long time, maybe even up to a few days. But I want to disprove the myth that diisopropyl ether can only be made through the Williamson ether synthesis. Diethyl ether is quickly made with high yields because of its SN2 pathway. The bulkier isopropyl group forces the reaction to take an SN1 pathway which has greater competition with E1. In layman's terms, isopropyl alcohol is more likely to dehydrate into propane gas rather than condense into liquid ether. This has been the hardest experiment so far and definitive proof that steric hindrance can be a real problem in an organic synthesis. Four hours into the experiment, I think it is time for a little refill. So I'm going to be putting in 200 milliliters of hot alcohol. Because I don't have a two-necked flask, I'm going to have to do this manually. We had minimal leakage because I can barely smell the ether. It came out for like a quick second. And as you can see, it is visibly boiling too. Look how vigorous those bubbles are now. Hopefully our ether will be quickly condensing from that. It has been 16 hours into the experiment. I've added 450 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol so far. Let's see how the receiving flask looks. I see a lot of good ether in there, easily over 100 milliliters so far. However, I want to get at least 500 milliliters of diisopropyl ether. In the reaction flask, the mixture has gone down significantly from when we added our alcohol a few hours ago. But I'm going to let it go down even more all the way until it's beneath the sand line. That way I can maximize ether production. It's been 30 hours, almost a day since the last addition. If we look at the drip rate, you can see it's going very slowly. This means we have made just about all the ether we can from the 450 milliliter addition a while ago. So, I'm going to add an additional 250 milliliters of alcohol. I'm barely going to lose any ether after this maneuver because the drip rate is so slow anyways. And now, we're back to where we started. 50 hours into the experiment, let's see how much ether we have collected. As you can see, we have more than 400 milliliters of ether in the receiving flask. After adding 250 milliliters of alcohol, I'm going to let this thing cook for another 20 hours, and then we're going to obtain our final yield. It's taken three days to use up an entire bottle of alcohol. Let's see how much ether we got. In our receiving flask, we have almost 500 milliliters of crude ether in there. Now I could let the reaction go on for another night, but the drip rate is so slow I might get at most another five grams out of this. So I'm gonna stop the reaction now and begin processing. The first thing I'm gonna do is put in my carbonate solution. This will neutralize any excess acid that went over. I highly doubt it because I kept it low and slow, but you never know. I'm going to shake it around a bit, just to make sure everything is neutralized. Now I'm going to be draining off my solution. Next, I'm going to put in my drying agent, magnesium sulfate. I'm going to keep my drying agent sitting there for a few minutes, just to make sure all the water is out. The next thing I'm going to do is put in my antioxidant, my sodium metabisulfite. This will neutralize any peroxides that I've already formed as well as prevent new ones from forming. 
I'm going to put in three scoops, that way I never have to worry about ether blowing up in my face when I open my bottle. Before I put in my ether, I'm going to weigh out my bottle. That way you can all see how much it weighs and my yield. Now I'm going to put in my ether. As you can see, the weight of the bottle is 460.9 grams. If we subtract that by 87, we have 373.9 grams. Our ideal yield was 580 grams. So if we divide 373.9 by 580, we get a 64.5% yield. That is very much on par with the average diethyl ether synthesis. So this goes to show that making diethyl ether is very much possible, given enough time. To make sure we have pure diethyl ether and not an ethereal alcohol mixture, we need to get the density. So let's just pour this out. We have 26.7 grams. The liquid stopped at the 36 and 37. So if we divide 26.7, by 36.5, we get the density of 0.73. The density of diisopropyl ether is 0.725. We know we have pure diisopropyl ether because the density is 0.73. So that's how we know we have made pure diisopropyl ether.